Bonjour. Hello. Hello. How are you guys doing? Great. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Slightly uh, uh, a little sick, but not with uh, the coronavirus. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, by, by what I can tell so far. Okay. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I, I think, are coming down with something as well. But I obviously don't think it's the virus. It's just funny coincidence. Yeah, my my uh, my daughter was sick last week before I left, and uh, so I think I brought some German school germs with me. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, a guy my wife works with, uh, I can't remember where he went. It was, it, was, it was either China or South America, but he came back with something really nasty. And uh, she ended up giving it to me. And I've, I've, I've never been wiped out quite as bad as that. And it just, you know, it sort of reminds you of sort of the, the danger of hanging around with people who travel a lot. You never know what you're going to pick up. Hmm. All right, Heinz, hello. Hello. Do, 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 Mr. Mitchell. Good morning. Hello, and Vlad. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Uh, Tommy. One day, Tommy, one day, you'll have to say something off on the phone. <laughs> okay. IBRK? Yeah, okay. That is Lucas, I believe, though, right? Just want to double check. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, one of these days I'll remember. Hey, Kathy. Kathy, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was on hey. ah, I figured you. I figured. Okay, hi. Hey, Ginger. Ginger, Colin, you guys there? Hey. Okay, I heard Colin. I think Ginger's hiding. Just using different um, AirPods this morning. <laughs> ah. <clears throat> Is it the new ones from Apple? Yes, it's very exciting. Yeah, I was, I was really excited. I hate the idea of spending that much money, but the idea of getting noise canceling ones just excited me so much. Yeah, and these are, you know, they have the little adjustable earbuds, so they actually stay in your ears, which is nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you tried them out on an airplane yet? I'm curious to know if they actually deaden the sound of the airplane itself. I haven't yet. Uh, Derek did, and he said they work really well. Excellent. That's what I really wanted them for. All right. Uh, Scott, are you there? Dog, 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 dog. Hello. Uh, Klaus? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Javier? 
Yes, I'm here. Oh, and Lionel? Yes, hello. Hello, Mr. Mark? Hi, Doug. Hello, and Ryan? Yes, hello. Hello. Uh, Thomas, are you there? Yep, hello. Hello. And Manuel, are you there? Manuel? Hi, he's there. Yep, gotcha, thank you. All right, give another minute and a half or so. <laughs> okay, who's coming in as K-Native Zoom? Oh, that's my comic. Shoot, I need oh. to fix my K my Zoom, I guess. No, that's okay. Just funny. Okay, R I P N R. Are you there? I am. Yes. Yes. Are this the first time on the call? No, I was here in December as well for some idea. Okay, so you should already be in the list. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Lost the... he's, with, he, he's with us. Oh, one of you guys. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Funny. All right, three after one, I'm going to get started. Um, no AI is worth talking about. Community time, anything from the community people want to bring up? Okay, in that case, let's go on to EU planning or KubeCon EU. So a couple things here. First, make sure if you are going, um, I'd love to get your name in there just so we can get an account for the face-to-face -face meeting. I guess if you're not going to go to the face-to-face -face meeting, we don't technically need to know, but it would still be nice if maybe I can rope some people in for the kiosk that we're going to be doing. Um, for the serverless session, um, I believe they're still working on the exact list of speakers and what the abstract is going to look like, but we did at least get um, something submitted, so they're on the schedule. Just work on the details there. For the cloud events session, uh, Clemens <clears throat> volunteered to, to cover the, the new spec itself, and I'll just do a quick overview of the CE stuff. In terms of the deep dive, since no one else volunteered here, I'm going to assume that Scott, you're okay with being the, the lone single speaker since it's probably gonna be relatively quick, but you have lots of volunteers here for helping in the lab. Does that sound okay to you? Sounds great. Okay, cool. And I did get an answer on the kiosk or one out of two answers. So VLA wanted to know whether we were limited to just AM PM for the same for all days or whether we can alternate during days. They said we can alternate if we wanted to, even though in the past it was typically either just morning or just afternoon. One thing I did not get a clear answer on yet is what does this last option mean? Whether it's just random, when do we want to show up and how does that work? Luckily we don't have to actually answer till February 14th, so you have a little bit of time to figure that out, but I at least want to give you guys that answer there. Okay, and I'm still waiting uh, for the room for the face-to-face, -face. okay? Anybody else have any questions or comments about KubeCon EU planning? Okay, in that case, I'm assuming the owners of the particular sessions will take charge and actually uh, work on their presentations and then share it with the group when they're ready. Um, as you do start creating your drafts, if you can put a link to the draft uh, presentation somewhere in the doc here so you can take a look at it when you get a chance, I appreciate that, okay. Moving forward, doo, 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 doo. okay, SDK. So um, I think we actually did have a call last week. Scott or anybody else, can you remember? Is there anything worth mentioning? Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the Golang SDK going 1.0 and uh, I'm about to cut that right now. That is cool, okay. Anything else worth mentioning? Or anybody else have a question? Okay, moving on then. Um, after I sent out my note on Monday or Tuesday, I can't remember when, about this potential Rust SDK, 
uh, somebody else, I believe they're in Europe, did ping me saying that they had some interns who put together this little SDK, um, but he's not quite sure whether those folks actually want to continue working on it because they were just interns, went back to school and stuff. So I'm trying to get a little more information from them in terms of whether they want to promote that as a possible REST SDK, maybe merge with these guys up here. Um, so I don't want to necessarily ask for a formal vote or anything yet on, on this call about this one, because I want to find out about the possibility of merging the efforts. But I do want to draw your attention to it. So if you guys could take a look at it, see if it seems like a worthy start. Um, it seemed like an okay thing to me, relatively on the smallish side. Like I'm not sure I necessarily had a whole bunch of different protocols, <clears throat> but as long as they're willing to work on that and add more, I didn't see an issue with it. Um, but again, I don't want to necessarily have a vote this week, maybe next week. Any questions on that? Okay, now to this one. I did reach out to the owner of the Ruby SDK and he hasn't made any changes since 2018. And he said, unfortunately, he's moved on to other bigger and better things, so he's not gonna have a chance to update that. So I would recommend that unless anybody knows somebody who wants to actually manage that, I would suggest that we actually archive that. I wasn't gonna propose that we delete the repository, but rather just change the name or something to indicate that it's not being worked on, it's archived, and it may be deleted in the future. Um, but I didn't want to necessarily lose the code that may have been done so far. Anybody so, any so it, instead yeah. of archiving it, perhaps add something to the README that says that it needs an owner or that it's not being worked on right now as a first step. Okay, that's, that's fine with me. Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, now that we know that we need an owner, um, I, I think all of us should start looking around. Uh, for people we know that might be interested. I certainly have some 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 people I'll go ask. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll, I'll open the PR to at least make it clear on uh, the current status, and then maybe on next week's call, we can revisit and see if anybody found a volunteer. Okay, oops. Okay, cool. Um, Kathy, is there anything from the service workflow group you'd like to update us on? Okay, so um, we're going to have the um, first uh, meeting on um, February 12th um, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Pacific time. So if anyone is interested in joining the workflow spec discussion, uh, either it's on the direction or functional scope or the, any technical points, yeah, you're welcome to join. And the time? calling number is the same as the cloud events uh, meeting calling number. Right, and what's the time of the call? Uh, it's 10 a.m. starting at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And is it weekly or bi-weekly? It's weekly, so we're, yeah, so we're now, now, yeah, this is first meeting. We can also discuss, you know, how we would like to um, move forward with the meeting. It's either weekly or bi-weekly. I set that up for weekly, um, okay. but we can, yeah, we can discuss that too. Okay, cool. Any questions for Kathy? All right, in that case, let's move on to the cloud subscription doc. All right, since, since Mike, your section is first, would you like to bring us up to date on where we are and talk about some of the changes that might have gone in? Sure, the uh, uh, couple of met and talked on Friday. Um, the, the biggest changes that came in is uh, a little bit more uh, enunciation of some use cases. In particular, we were um, uh, discussing this the second paragraph there about um, how you might aggregate uh, discovery uh, or um, the sort of a middleware for discovery. So the uh, trying to think about the the difference there. Um, I might provide like a useful collection of hey, here are some cloud events that you can discover but you have to go back to the original producer to actually create the subscription versus like I'm doing this, um, I'm actually providing a middleware provider where uh, you would come back to me for discovery and I might go make that subscription upstream, but I am actually aggregating the events uh, internally. So I think, we, I think we probably need to settle on, on better terms than middleware and aggregator because they can be uh, kind of confusing. Um, but you know, we, we spent a good bit of time talking about that particular that particular use case and making sure it was supported. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to call out or have a discussion on in this call? Can't think of anything. Scott, you're also there. Kathy? 
that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I think what we are we were discussing is um, how we is it the producer that will um, so the, if we say where's the boundary for that uh, API um, this discovery API. So the I think we we decided to on the producer boundaries. The producer will provide that. Then there's a question is if there's a middleware, um, either it's a um, gateway or whatever, right? Is that a producer or that just a transparent entity which will pass the all the discovery APIs to the producer? Or we define that as a producer, something like that. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for that team? Well, I will have a point of discussion, but I'm on next. <laughs> Okay. Any anyone have any questions for this section? Okay. In that case, I guess moving on. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Clemens, you are up. Yes. So um, I had uh, amended the uh, uh, the document with uh, some um, explanation of what the kinds of subscriptions are that we um, ought to cover. And uh, there's effectively two models, and, and we spoke about this uh, on, on our call, effectively two models. There's a, a pulled subscription where you walk up to some, typically some middleware, but not necessarily middleware. Um, and you use uh, a gesture, typically in the application protocol to um, start soliciting events from there, uh, which is pull. Uh, and the other model, um, is um, where you effectively configure some sort of pop up engine or uh, the producer itself to deliver events to a target, which might be directed at the subscriber itself or might be direct might be directed elsewhere, where the subscriber effectively acts on on behalf of that target. Um, so that's the push model. Um, and, and ultimately, um, it's uh, a you know whether the the um, and so the pull model, sorry, is typically done using some level of pub sub protocol. Um, and so I've covered um, the cases here, explicitly explained the, the methods that exist in MQTT, MQP, and NATS, which is which are the the true pub sub protocols that we that we support, which allow you for some level of of uh, filtering on the event stream or on events. And um, there is no, while, while this is practiced also with HTTP, um, you know, to be able to walk up to a event store of some sort and, and pull events out, there is no, I would argue, standardized mechanism to do this. So I've, what I've done here, what the goal was of this section is to basically prescribe, describe what exists in the existing um, protocols with the goal that if you are um, using an MQTT broker um, and you're using MQTT, um, an MQTT broker with cloud events, then um, you should not need extra magic to manage subscriptions, right? It should be within the scope of the specification. It should be compliant that to do, you know, pops up, Cloud events pops up in the sense of this specification just by using MQTT if you're in that world. Um, because, and this is something that I think is important uh, for compliance in enterprise scenarios where people are just doing you know, checklist compliance uh, um, uh, verifications where you know, they're now asking you, are you supporting cloud events uh, subscriptions? And uh, you, know, you should be able to say, to say yes if you do it with the MQTT protocol or with, with the MQP protocol or with the NATS protocol without having to do any unnatural acts. So that's why um, I have this in here. And then we've um, moved on to um, you know, talking about some, some of the push subscriptions, which is effectively then, then configuring the, the middleware or the, um, the producer. And there is an interaction that obviously needs to exist with the discovery mechanism. Um, because 
uh, we think of the 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 at least that's where we where we were headed. I think uh, the others can correct me. Um, as the subscription API and the discovery API is really clearly distinct, um, and the discovery API should yield the endpoint where you can go and subscribe and should then also yield what the protocol is by which you can can subscribe um, and then you um, effectively establish a a, uh, a subscription um, over the the endpoint that's indicated uh, in the um, discovery in the discovery metadata so and then that yields that the discovery the discovery system should either allow for you know a centralized consolidated view of all the event sources that exist within the scope of a system um, or it should if that is so that you have a um, if you can literally subscribe at the producer um, that you can also have a local view of all the things that the producer gives you so that your first interaction might just be to talk to the discovery endpoint of that producer and then that gives you the necessary network information to um, um, then um, you know establish your subscription. Now moving on a little bit further down to the the uh, um, information model that's already there in the document, right? This is kind of where we stopped. One of the things that we've we talked about is that we need to go and specialize that for various transports and at a minimum for all the transports that we have as part of cloud in the core of cloud events and then also make that extensible because we have at least from a security perspective and let's start there we have two contexts we have the context of um, being able to su subscribe there's arguably there's three right there's a discovery endpoint and then there's a subscription endpoint and there is a, a delivery endpoint if you do push push um, delivery and these may all three be different um, one thing that we found summarily um, insufficient is to have literal cred credentials here um, and uh, while that is common um, and it's nice that it already mentions tokens this should be a mechanism that probably ties into um, in, in a fairly explicit way into um, a um, into an authorization framework. Um, so I have to go and figure out how to how to do that because we will have to figure out how these these um, you know different security contexts that we have here are interacting and then also how stuff works like uh, renewal because if you're setting up a subscription and that subscription is long lived over you know months or years. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that for an interoperable solution, we get around doing something like OAuth, where you get a, a renewal token, and then you have to present that renewal token occasionally to a um, an STS, which then acts as a circuit breaker. So we that's the OAuth two is the model that I think has the broadest consensus around the industry, and it's hard for me to to imagine that we can get around um, using a, me a mechanism like this um, across protocol boundaries here. Um, and so we're going to look at the information, that information model for specifically around push for the various transports, you know, what the information is that we need and also what is the, the transport, information, transport information that we need. For instance, for MQTT, you may want to um, configure whether you want to deliver the event at, with Quas 0 or Quas 1 or Quas 2, which are various level of uh, delivery assurance in, in MQTT. Um, and these are all things that I think for the particular protocols that we have, we'll have to go and uh, specify that's So that's kind of the state of, of where we were from the last um, uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I have volunteered to start to do a draft of the, the specialized uh, data models um, for the various transports. All right, cool. Any questions for Clemens or anybody else in the working group? Uh, yes, a quick one. Uh, I, I didn't read the document, sorry, but uh, in case of a broker-based um, subsystem, is that would that be transparent? So would it consist of two subscriptions, one being the broker asking the the origin of the event to submit events to the broker and a second subscription of a consumer to ask the broker to deliver events or? 
um, we have we have uh, um, this this transitive scenario we've tabled for the initial round. Uh, we we talked about this initially. Um, I think we'll have to get to it, but it adds um, quite a bit of of uh, complication. I think the way we get around this um, is uh, by um, so let, let me back out. There is a clear need in some scenarios where you have such scale at the producer side that you want to avoid raising events that you know are not being consumed. And then there is such scale at the consumer side that the producer can't possibly handle that load. So in those scenarios of which we have in Azure a few, um, for instance, in, in case of uh, Azure storage raising events, um, we literally go and, and notify Azure Storage uh, from EventGrid whether there are any any subscriptions, and only then they turn on the event feed for that particular context. And when they're when all the subscriptions are gone, we we tell them to go and turn off that event event feed. So that's a that is is something that I know is required. Um, I would I would like to focus on getting the simple case managed first and uh, then see what the upstream um, model needs to be to effectively communicate that, um, that subscription up to the source. Because the mechanism is not necessarily trivial because the producer's relationship to a middleware is usually one where they simply send and you don't necessarily have a back path to them for how you can tell them um, uh, how to, uh, you don't necessarily have a subscription API on that producer. Exactly. Yeah, on the broker. Yeah. So, and I, since since I'm incapable of magic, um, I, I ideally the 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 subscription API is completely symmetric, in the way that um, effectively a producer has its own, and this is there's interaction with the discovery mechanism. I think that's that's what then ends up ends up in the the producer basically says here's the bunch here here are the events that I can produce and makes those available, makes that catalog available to the middleware. And the middleware basically creates a consolidated catalog. And in that consolidated catalog, it might go and replace the, the subscription endpoint endpoints with its own. And then as actual subscriptions ar arrive, it, it starts ref counting on, on, those, um, on those events. And uh, will then, um, you know, if there is a is an endpoint that it can call to go and, and trigger subscriptions for events on that producer, it will do so. Um, and otherwise, if there is no such subscription URI, that basically indicates that um, the producer will produce at all times, and it will basically just deliver through that middleware. So there's a mechanism we can go and figure out. Um, to communicate that fact and either make it active because you need to have a back path or to make it passive where the producer always produces into the middleware and then basically delegate subscription to it. So I think we can go and find a relatively elegant way for that. Okay, Heinz, your hands up. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, it sounds like it would all work if you assumed everything was a fully qualified, you know, subscription to like a, uh, a delimited topic. However, most producers have it like a canonical representation where each field is significant, but every time you publish, those fields will vary. You know, a case in point might be a simple a stock market uh, publisher from a gateway yeah. where there's like 10,000 trading instruments and that would be one field. So if you went to subscribe, how would it know the 10,000 subscriptions? How do you apply wildcards? Where would they be applied? What are your thoughts on uh, solving that problem? So we we, we briefly touched on this, um, uh, but not to in, on the previous call we had in terms of filters. And you'll see that there's a fi filters field. Um, filtering is something we'll have to go and support. It's just not yet clear to me to what level we can achieve um, agreement on filters. And we'll certainly try. Um, on a filters model, just just for but one one thing that I shared with with our group is uh, the the filter spec that we have in MQP, and and the choice we, that we made in MQP initially was to 
define the existence of filters, but not be particular about those filters and, and not define syntax. And it has taken us now uh, about seven years to actually get to a point where we, where we have a, a, a filter spec that um, uh, we um, agreed on. Um, also because we were initially all mostly all relying on the GMS precedent and the GMS filter set, which now is no longer no longer sufficient. So um, yeah, there's some precedent and th there's also in terms of filters, depending on what the product is and the protocol is that you that you're working with, um, they are already built in and they're already kind of implied by what what people practice. So I yes, so I believe that there must be a filtering mechanism that there must be a way to have differentiation by subject differentiation probably e or even by custom effort. um but what the filter language is what the filter mechanism is is something that we'll have to go and and, um, and discuss in the big group once we get to that point so that's something that i, I really want to get to okay uh, i'm sorry klaus i think your hands next yes so um I think, yeah, the filters are important for fields like subject and so on, but there are also fields that typically more go into the um, topics like the source and even the ways we have defined source it might also vary. So um, I'm not sure if in all cases it will be possible to um, have a fixed list of sources uh, of a producer. There are some fields like, I don't know if the source is something like a workflow ID or something. Um, that might vary a lot. So, so I wonder if, if really um, also in discovery, a fixed list of sources will be the right thing or if you will have something like templates for source URIs. <laughs> yeah, I think you will have to. For, for subjects, you will certainly have to. For sources, you might, all, depending on what the scale of those are, um, of the systems are, you, it may make sense. I'm not sure whether it makes, whether it's useful to have a hundred thousand uh, different uh, event in individual uh, event catalog registrations for what is effectively the same event, but by different instances of a system. Yeah, that's true. So we have so far a very fixed list of sources, but still from how we defined it in the standard, um, it, it also allows to have this a lot more fine grained, I think. Okay, um, Heinz, is, there, is your hand old or new? New. New, okay, go for it. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, on the uh, my original question. Actually, my biggest concern was more on the um, subscription discovery. Where uh, again, if I have, you know, to use the uh, stock market type uh, scenario, if I have one field that has ten thousand different potential enumerations in that field, um, I mean, have you got suggestions on how would you do that discovery? which then would lead to, I would need to know some way to uh, either potentially filter, but more importantly, if I have it as a fully qualified name, how do I know that fully qualified name if there's 10,000 potential fully qualified names where only one field changes? Yeah. Um, gr great question. I think that's something that the discovery, that the discovery part needs to solve. Right. Sorry for punting that, but uh, that sounds like a discovery problem. Mike, did you want to comment on that or just leave it there? Do we lose Mike? Oh, here he is. I'm here. Um, I don't know if I have any immediate response. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, Ryan, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, first, I'll, I'll echo. Um, the idea that a source, um, at least at Twilio, we think of a source as um, an instance of some kind of object or, or, or something that emits events. Um, uh, and that is definitely not static. Um, so for example, at Twilio, um, you might have an instance of a phone call that has a specific identifier that is short-lived um, just for the lifetime of that call. And um, you might have consumers that want to subscribe events for particular calls or particular messages, et cetera. So um, I'll echo um, just that, that thought. Um, the, the second uh, comment I wanted to make is um, another thing we talked about on the call was um, you know, what goes into, we have uh, this config map. Um, so uh, I, 
I would prefer to be opinionated about what goes into there. Um, and I think the um, sort of verbal agreement um, that we had was that should be um, potentially just transport specific configuration, whereas uh, other, um, uh, other configuration or other, uh, uh, other things that you need to put into the subscription um, should probably be promoted to the top level. So for example, I did comment on the filters and I know you, you pulled that out. Thanks for doing that. Um, so I think I would like to have just a, a framework for what goes into the config um, and, and what goes into you know, a, a top level um, item. Okay, uh, Vila, your hand's up next. So, well, I was wanting to ask about the filter stuff, but it seems like there's other questions about config map. So I don't know if you want to go and deal with those first and then I can ask about filters. No, go for it. Okay, yeah, I was kind of curious if you think that there might be a, uh, or if there's even any value in, in tackling this in maybe um, two phases where one of them would be where you can go ahead and filter based on common cloud events attributes. And then, um, I mean, just kind of going back to the, hey, we've been trying to do this for seven years and maybe this is not the year, but is there a way to go and at least uh, start putting in some uh, standard filters that you might be able to do and then um, learn from that experience. So what we've done, what we've done on, on uh, event grid, for instance, is um, instead of having a complex filtering, filtering model, um, we um, have initially effectively three filter conditions. That's our simple filter model effectively, which is a prefix and suffix Fil so there's a there's a full match and prefix and suffix uh, uh, condition on type subject and uh, source. So that's the the um, the minimal the, the the minimal set that we have. So you can effectively, if you're looking for um, you know a blob created event from a st from storage, and you only want to have the events for JPEG files. Right, you make a um, you make a filter for the type blob created. Uh, the source is uh, then effectively matching the container which you, where you want to have that from, um, and then the um, uh, the subject is a suffix filter on .jp, .jpg. JPG, and, and that's and that's kind of and that's the 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 simple condition. And then we added also a. Um, a direct match table for attributes you can set on that on the on the event, um, which is effectively just the you know key value pairs with the expected values, and if they match match directly, then um, that's also matching. So we can start with something that's that's that simple, and then see how how that's whether that's uh, sufficient. Yeah, because it just seems like we can say we can do we, we, we can't agree on anything and I think that there's some things that we kind of all agree on that would add some value to the users today that we could probably start and those seem like reasonable things to look at so just wanted to throw that out there I'll, I'll be happy I'll be happy to be surprised that if we can agree on that would be great <laughs> okay um, I'll go and then Heinz I'll jump over to you um, and I'm not actually looking for you guys to do more work, but it does dawn on me that in this in the cloud events spec when we're working on that, we did end up producing a document that talked about, you know, what are the current events that are produced by the various products out there today, just as a informational kind of a thing. I'm wondering as you guys are producing or doing your analysis to figure out what we want to put in this spec, if you're gathering information about what's already out there today and that text isn't necessarily proper for a proper spec per se, but it may be information for the primer that we're going to produce after this or something like that. If you guys can just jot that down to some document someplace, even if it's the bottom of this one, just so that people can see what's out there today and they can sort of compare and contrast for, from what we're doing versus what's out there today. Um, I think that might be interesting if you guys, for both sections of the spec, could, could do that. Like I said, I'm not necessarily looking for extra work, but if you happen to be doing it anyway, you might as well just toss it in the doc so we have it as, as reference. And with that, I'll hand it over to Heinz. Sorry, uh, just a quick uh, question again is, it sounds like the filtering is starting to uh, address almost like a content routing or something that might be like a virtual service and service mesh. Uh, however, most, if you're targeting the messaging systems, 
all the filtering is based only on the uh, topic or queue name. So uh, uh, I'm just wondering, how are you going to blend those two together? And if the intention is like a uh, pre-filter, uh, where once I receive the message, maybe based on a topic or the event based on a topic, that I would decide if I want to see it or not. Uh, those are usually frowned upon because uh, if you are going to an async push model, the last thing I want to do is not have the broker do the filtering, but then push everything to the client and expect the client to do that uh, filtering, which is really the role of the uh, broker. So I'm wondering how are you going to address where you're kind of going towards content routing, but it doesn't really apply for uh, messaging type scenarios. So, so I would, I disagree with that. Um, because the, so there are some brokers which are relatively simple. Um, so Nats has a subject based model. Uh, MQTT has a, ha, literally has this topic, uh, the topic model, um, which is based on the, um, the original, um, MQ, um, a topic model, but every most, most modern, most modern, uh, enterprise brokers actually have a fairly sophisticated way of doing filters. Um, so if you look at, at, at active MQ, if you look at, uh, you know, MQ, the, 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 the modern version of topics in, in, in MQ, if you look at TIPCO, if you look at service buff, what we have, all of them have a SQL based filter language that can go and effectively inspect any, uh, aspect of uh, the message and then route based on those. And we have in actually, <clears throat> that's not correct. It only does inspection on headers. Yeah, yeah, and they use selector functions, yeah. which are also kill performance and are usually for all those protocols, not recommended because they were originally designed for uh, uh, addressing that didn't support a hierarchical addressing. So that was the way they could uh, do some. Uh, so, so I don't think that's true because we certainly, we certainly recommend that you use them and our customers are using them uh, a, a lot across you know, thousands of customers. And what we see customers that are coming with lift and shift workloads from other brokers into the Azure cloud, mostly everybody's using message selectors for all kinds of scenarios. So, so they are very, very common. And yes, they, they only operate on the metadata of the message, but that is exactly in tune with, with the, the, the spirit of what we did in cloud events, we, because we chose literally to ignore data, which is the body of the message and focus on the metadata. Trust me, it does horrendously <laughs> affect performance. Having worked no, with Tipco no, for 13 actually, years, trust it, me. <laughs> no, it's actually, so I, I know that it affects performance, right? But it's also a fact that it, they are, they are, they are intensively used in all those broker products. I mean, I, I run one. So, so I, I mean, we can, we can tell what that costs and we, and customers know what that costs, but we have enough firepower for, for customers to use them and they do. So I don't think we necessarily want to rattle on filters here because I think this is going to be one of those topics that's just, it's going to take a long time. So is it fair to, to hold this? Okay. In that case, let me jump over to Mike then because I think his hand is up next. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, we need to align the filter piece between both the subscriptions and the discovery. So I put some filter specific stuff in discovery, which is different than what's up here. Uh, in particular, uh, echoing what Vila said, I think it's interesting to think about providing some cloud events attribute specific filtering as these are meant to transit cloud events, but also acknowledging that uh, certain producers are gonna have different domain specific languages that, that, that um, uh, need to be there in order to like power the subscription at, at all. Um, so I, that, that's what I wrote in the discovery section. So if it sounds like there's some disagreement and maybe some more discussion that needs to happen on filtering. Yes. And and that's and that's why I said initially, filtering will be con will be contentious. <laughs> yeah, but at least we can blame Vile because he's the one that brought it up on today's call. So, okay. any other topics for discussion relative to this part of the spec? Any other questions for Clemens or anybody have any comment from the rest of the working group members? Okay, in that case. Let's jump over to the cloud event stuff. <clears throat> Two things here, actually maybe three. First off, 
I did notice um, that, uh, here, actually, let me show you the, hold on a minute. The readme was missing two, actually, I can just hear, the Avro spec and the Kafka spec were missing an entry for the under V10 column. So let me show you what it looks like. Do, 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 do. So on the main one right now, that's blank and that's blank. And I can't for life me remember if I just messed up or whether we actually did not choose to, to promote those to 1.0 for some reason. Does anybody remember? Because if not, I'm gonna assume it was just a typo or mistake on my part and we, just, and we really need to add them. Okay, not hearing anybody thinking that we did that on purpose. Any objection then to adding that? Okay, cool, thank you guys. I just wanna make sure I wasn't forgetting something. Uh, now here, um, issue 545 had a whole bunch of different topics in there, but one of the things they, that they talked about or asked about was around the size limits, in particular the 64K stuff. And they're wondering whether that's a hard limit or whether it's just a recommendation, that kind of stuff. And Clemens, I think that mainly came from you. And it, my recollection was that that's more of a recommendation kind of thing in terms of that's the minimum we expect people to support. But we, and while we don't necessarily come right out and say you can't go past that, it is, it is kind of a strong hint to keep things relatively small, right? Yeah. And so what I thought, okay, that might be useful to add into the primer. So I added some texture for the primer. I'm not gonna suggest that we approve this here because I just put it in there yesterday. And there's a rule that says everything has to be there for two days. But please, when you get a chance, take a look at this. And obviously, in particular, Clemens, if you can wordsmith it as appropriate, um, since you wrote the original text. I'd appreciate you guys just looking at this stuff. Yeah, and, and Christoph should also chime in because uh, I, th I remember there was an epic fight. So That's a good point. Yeah, I'll ping him as well. That's a good one. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any questions about that, though? Not necessarily about the text itself, but just in general. Okay. Um, in that case, one other topic that might be worthy of discussion is this one. So, Scott, I'm going to lean on you here for a sec, since you're definitely involved in this discussion. You want to summarize what the concern is with this issue? I, yeah, I think it boils down to, so in the spec, we allow for flattening of a JSON object into a structured JSON encoding as the third box on the screen. And it, it actually is really difficult for, for consumers of the event to understand uh, the, how they should process the data argument if it's uh, optimized for JSON in this way. And the spec kind of goes through like, well, if it's there, then you have to like look for, if it's encoded as a string, it might be a JSON string. Uh, and if you're, at, if you're trying to marshal that into a structure, then uh, the string might be a, a JSON encoded structure that you can then turn into bytes and then turn into uh, the uh, a, an encoded version of or a, a, an unmarshaled version of your structure versus the the third example there where it's the that first pass uh, string escaping has already happened and so there's there's this like inspection case where you have to do some uh, data reflection to actually understand how to marshal this thing correctly. So, so I, I, my hands up. Let me ask a quick question. Um, Scott, in this second example, I, this is the one that really confuses me when you say that this can be interpreted as sort of encoded JSON. My understanding from reading the spec this morning anyway was from the cloud events perspective, this is a string. The fact that it looks like JSON is irrelevant to the spec. Correct. The application, when it receives it, it can do some inspection and say, hey, look at this. I noticed curly braces. I'm going to say this is a string. Or, I'm sorry. I'm going to notice this is JSON. I'm going to do something else with it. But from the interaction from the cloud events into the consumer, this is a string. It is not JSON. So I wanted that's to know. Right, that's right. But the way you have to interpret it is uh, based on your application. But the, the spec doesn't really see a difference between the two. But the doesn't spec. it? Because the spec says this is a string, and well, down here it's JSON. I can flip the encoding. Like I can take a conical version, and then two encoders could produce either of those, and they'd be they'd be valid for the 
uh, the specification. They'd be spec compliant results. I'm gonna think about that. Clemens, you go ahead, you're next. The, the, the spec, the, J, the, the JSON format says, um, uh, the implementation for any other type, which before that is the binary, the binary path, the implementation must translate the data value into a JSON value and use the member named data to store it inside the JSON object. So there's a, effectively there's a there's an Im implication that if that it is a JSON value which includes JSON object, and uh, which means it, in the JSON case when it's when it's defined when the data content type is declaring that this is JSON, then it's expected that in the JSON format, which is the only case where that can happen, that it is that the data content is effectively, if it's not um, data base 64, which means it's not binary, then it is always a JSON value, which means that case is a string. If that's what the language says in the spec, that it probably changed because I remember reading it as a may. No, look at look at three one third paragraph. Yeah, hold on a minute. Let me bring it up. Come on. Jason, but in the base, in the Jason, in the, no, no, oh, in yeah, you're right. Sorry, wrong spec. Jason format. Three, three, one. Yeah. It's this stuff right here, I believe, right? It's this is effectively for any other type is, is where it's not binary. Where it's not binary. So that was changed in October, I think, after a discussion between Ellen and myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that must used to be a, uh, a May book. Was that before we had the data underscore base 64? I think that's true. Look at the blame. <laughs> I won't go there yet. Although I do like the idea of blaming Klaus, so maybe, maybe we can just do that. <laughs> Okay, I just got back into the call. So. I know, and um, that's why I picked on you. I noticed you. Ah, okay. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so what's the blame anyways? I, I'm still, I, I thought I was happy with this, so. <laughs> I, I am happy with this. This is uh, this right, this right now. Yeah, we just need to figure out how to respond to the person who opened up this issue. It, so, okay. It's right. The, 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 you would assume the same behavior for the JSON encoding, but the JSON encoding is different. And especially, especially called out that way. Well, I already responded that um, it needs to be a JSON value. And in case of JSON, it is already a value. So yeah. no escaping needed. OK. Well, I need, I need to go back, or we need to go back and double check and see whether Kevin's last response, yeah. whether he's OK or not. And if not, we need to respond back to him to make him happy. So even for so so the the thing is even for the case so when it is not binary, right? So it's it's not base sixty four encoded, then it is always a JSON value, and then if it if the data content type says text XML, then you find then you know you're expecting text and you'll find the text in a string because it's no there's no other way, but if it says JSON, well then you have a JSON value that you can it, interpret directly. Yeah, that's that's how it's written now. That's not how it was written uh, nine months ago or whatever. Well, okay. Well, that's years ago. It was ages. Uh, <laughs> Eons. Okay, so at least it seems like everybody on the call here might be realigned, which is good. Um, yeah. So we just need to figure out how to re respond back to um, what's his name, Kevin. Yeah, I, I have a standard template of like, I'm wrong, I did it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have those, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that was it in terms of issues that I wanted to bring up. Uh, actually, no, there's one. So one of, the, one of the really, really, really old issues that may have been opened up by Sarah ages ago was how do we uh, add or remove, um, what's the word, uh, admins, uh, you know, the the guys who do manage the phone calls and manage all the, the GORP for us, you know, because everybody's maintained it based upon voting rights, but relative to the administrative tasks, I think there's three of us, there's me, Mark, and Ken. And we probably need some documentation in the governance doc that says, how do you add or remove people from there? And every now and then I think about this and I was gonna write a PR, but I didn't get around to it. But let me ask you guys, 
whether you're okay with my, the, the general direction of what I want to write up. And my basic thought process is, if you want to remove one of the admins, then all it requires is greater than 50% vote from the voting members. If, you, if someone wants to be added as an admin, again, greater than 50% of the vote of the voter members. So basically that's how you can add and remove administrative folks. Anybody have any comment on that? Does it seem too low, too high, completely the wrong direction? You are not allowed to leave, but otherwise that's okay. <laughs> we'll have a discussion about that. Okay. I, I, I say, oh, that's a good point though. I need to add text in that says, how does someone, you know, get out of this role if they want it? And you can't obviously force them, but I should add text to that effect. So thank you, Clemens, for the joke, but it, I do need to put something in there for that. Like a Doug bus factor. <laughs> Moving on, any other, any other comments or questions about that proposed direction? Okay, not hearing any, I'll write up the PR, that way we can try to close out that longstanding issue. Okay, any other topics for discussion today? All right, did I miss anybody on the call? I think I got everybody, but just so I can make sure your name's there. If not, let me know. Give me a couple of seconds to double check. All right, in that case, we are adjourned. Thanks guys, we'll talk again next week. Pleasure as always. Thank you. Yep, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. bye.